Carissa, because I don't know your situation uh, intimately. Um, I, I obviously can't advise you, but definitely um, people often will use, twist these teachings or spiritual teachings in general as um, an excuse for not leaving an abusive situation. So a hint is that all the social workers and all your friends and people are saying, get out of there. <laughs> There's often something uh, deeply habitual and something uh, like staying as miserable as it is represents ground and leaving represents uncertainty and groundlessness. So that something uh, habitual in yourself is causing you to not leave. But I would say, uh, one has to be really clear, and, and the more the more you move beyond uh, the cocoon mentality of trying to hide from what's happening, the more clearly you see when it's time to go and leave a situation. So if it's an abusive situation, with or without children, get out of there. You know? And then you'll see what what happens next, you know. But what uh, what my teachers have always told me and what I've actually know from watching so many uh, men and women go through this kind of thing is that it's usually the kindest, most compassionate thing you can do for the, for the abuser is to get out of that situation so they whose self-hatred is growing every time they beat up you, uh, some kind of break and not no guarantees that something will change but if it is going to change it's going to change because the pattern is broken by you leaving and saying enough's enough so I hope that's helpful teachings on the uh, six paramitas. Suzuki Roshi, who is a wonderful Zen master, he died a, quite a long time ago, but you may know his book, Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. If you don't know that book, that is a wonderful book. I think I've read that about 50 times. And he calls these the six ways of true living, which I think is great. The six ways of true living. So I'd like to begin by talking about exertion. And it's said that the essence of the paramita of exertion is a sense of joy to do what nurtures the root of happiness sense of joy to do what begins to dissolve the roots of suffering. So that implies a certain um, insight into what does nurture the root of happiness and dissolve the root of suffering. Since we are quite good at doing the other without even giving it a second thought, we're really like kind of experts at nurturing the roots of suffering. But it takes some insight to know what actually causes us to lighten up and to connect with the true heart of Bodhicitta, to connect with our true nature, as it's called, and uh, to remember who we really are. It takes some insight. So you could say that perhaps the first step is the advice given under the teaching on prajna, which is that some sense of joy, exertion and joy to uh, begin to study, listen, and explore the dharma at the level of just uh, being thirsty for teaching and reading and listening. A joy in doing that. And then uh, joy in contemplating what we're hearing about or studying, reading the books, contemplating it, and then joining and meditating on it. 
which as I explained, contemplation is more like you, you have this question. Well, many of us take something like the word a discipline and the contemplation, I mean, it's not artificial, it's really truly wanting to know what is discipline in the sense of a paramita that takes you beyond the suffering of being caught in passion, aggression, and aversion. What is discipline in that sense, rather than a rigid code that just makes things more unhappy? So you take uh, something like the notion of discipline or the notion of patience, or any of these. Paramitas are excellent ones to just read as much as you can on the subject in all kinds of places, listen to teachings on them, and then contemplate it. And contemplation, in terms of this exertion, is everything from just going for a long walk and just thinking about it, to actually um, ask yourself on the spot in your life, the exertion, sort of sense of joyful exertion, that on the spot you say, well, what does the paramita sense of patience have to do with this enormous resistance I'm feeling right now, or the enormous loneliness or depression I'm feeling right now, sense of despair? You know, in other words, when you're really in the darkest moments of being caught in rage or caught in depression, caught in immense self-loathing, that's an excellent time to contemplate. And uh, it might not feel all that joyful at that time, but that's the notion of exertion. It's like it occurs to you that if at that point you really began to wonder what the teachings had to do with your depression and how they could help, that uh, it's not exactly that your depression would suddenly lift, but it's like going in the direction of discovering the root of happiness. So contemplation has a lot to do with bringing the, especially the difficult situations in the life, right together with the teachings and wondering about them. So joy in basically benefiting yourself and uh, knowing that by doing this, benefiting others. They say the kind of mistaken notion of joy is, you know, joy in benefiting yourself in a kind of indulgent way, which brings instant gratification, but... uh, continual hangover that gets worse and worse and worse. So, exertion without a hangover. And then finally, that kind of joy, sense of exertion towards meditation is this, uh, it's like a curiosity, joy to take these questions, these real life questions, and also just the meaning of certain words and uh, things that you've heard bringing it to meditation, which basically means you sit down with a sort of question in your mind, but then you just keep letting the thoughts go and coming back to the present moment, coming back to the out-breath. And there's some sense that you're not really thinking about it. But that's when the insight starts to arise. And the insight doesn't always arise. That's for sure. I mean, you know, you fall asleep and back hurts and lots of things, and then you get discursive about what you're going to cook for dinner or your latest worry, your latest plan. But there is a sense of bringing the Dharma to your meditation in the sense of you come with a kind of question and then you just let the discursiveness go, and in the space, that's where the insights are on. So it's kind of this threefold process that begins to bring insight And then the sense of exertion grows because you really begin to know what is going to make things lighter. Maybe not instantly, maybe it's a gradual process, but you can see that it's making things lighter. And you already know really well what makes things heavier. So, joy to do what wakes you up. That's the notion of exertion. So it's like connecting with a spark of energy. They say inherent in every moment is this good energy, good life energy. So you start out with just some kind of exertion in the sense of this joyfulness or this enthusiasm. I like that. But it's sort of beginning to be enthusiastic, but in the sense of making the 
effort to do what is conducive to developing this inner strength and what is conducive to developing a flexible mind. And what is conducive to development of trust in your basic nature. Trust in your bodhicitta. So that kind of strength. What is conducive to that growing? So this is the notion of exertion. And uh, one of the analogies that I always like is People say, like, exertion, well, that's like trying to climb up an icy mountain with slippery boots with a heavy backpack, you know, just like trying. It wasn't in the Greek mythology, but it was always pushing that boulder up. Sisyphus, always pushing, Sisyphus, pushing the rock up, up, up. So it isn't like that. The more the analogy is like um, waking up, in the morning, in the cabin, and it's freezing cold, and you're going to do something that day that really appeals to you. And, you know, habitually, you just want to stay in that nice warm bed, but there's a sense of joy to jump out of bed and light the fire and get going with the day. And it takes a sort of enthusiasm, joy. So there are these three kinds of um, exertion. In the tradition, they talk about the armor of exertion, the action of exertion, and insatiable exertion. And uh, the notion of armor there, it's interesting because I so often use the notion of armor as like uh, we armor our hearts, we armor ourselves, like barricading ourselves. But in this case, in this teaching, it means protection against hurting ourselves and hurting others. Exertion, this kind of enthusiasm or this joy to do what helps us rather than hurts us is like armor. And so in this sense, one of the qualities of exertion that's expressed by this notion of armor or protection is that it, exertion can be encouraging to us. You know, like maybe jumping out of bed is because the Meditation gone is gone. <laughs> and you know on this particular day, the person who's supposed to come and get you if you don't show up for meditation is, has gone to town. And then there's that moment of like, shall I just stay in this bed? <laughs> so it might be that you want to stay in bed because you're depressed. And so you encourage yourself because you know from your own experience that staying in bed makes the depression worse, and actually getting up and putting some cold water on your face and going to the meditation and starting to sit, actually something lifts and changes. So you encourage yourself. In the beginning, I think we do it a lot on just uh, well, experimenting to see what happens. But the trust begins to grow in what actually benefits us and others. So that's the notion of exertion and protection. And then the notion of the action of exertion. Usually in the traditional teachings, we talk about this quality of exertion is the sense of urgency. And uh, I think this is interesting that it's like now that I'm over 60, I have a sense of urgency that I didn't have before. And it's been growing since I was 50, so it gets stronger. <laughs> Where you actually have a real clear sense that you don't know how much more you have. And the sense of urgency grows that you don't want to waste one minute. On the other hand, if that sense of urgency was like beating yourself up, well, you already know that that's not how you want to spend the last seconds of your life. You know, saying, you must go to that meditation hall and you're bad if you don't. Or any of this kind of heavy stuff, self uh, denigrating kind of stuff. So it's just more the urgency that you don't want to waste a moment because you know you could use that time to um, sow the seeds of happiness and dissolve the seeds of suffering for yourself and others. And that's what you want to do. So the traditional analogy that's given for urgency is it's like if you are sitting somewhere and suddenly a poisonous snake lands in your lap. You don't think about it. Oh, 
don't know if it's poisonous or not. Or, you know, oh my goodness, look at the interesting pattern on it. I wonder why its tail is going rattle, rattle, rattle. <laughs> so you, if the uh, idea of urgency is you just see the danger and you just jump up. So, um, Trump Rambo Shea was speaking on this. He said, when you talk about exertion, you also usually was teaching on laziness, and maybe I'll um, say a little about that. So he was actually into the teaching on the laziness part. <laughs> and so someone's asking him about that, because one of the kinds of laziness is a, just only seeking comfort by boring attention. You know, just comfort orientation over what actually might give you strength. And someone doesn't quite get it, and they're asking him. He says, well, you know, it's sort of like you're sitting around your California pavilion by the pool, soaking up the sun, talking about Dharma with your friends, and suddenly a snake lands in your lap. <laughs> so, urgency. The other one is that your hair catches on fire. So you don't kind of wait around to think about it. Has and finally, this insatiable joyfulness. It's interesting. Huh? Again, when Suzuki Roshi teaches, he always talks again and again about practicing and studying with no gate idea. And this uh, is that it's an unusual kind of exertion because it's actually not an exertion towards reaching a final goal or a final stage. It's basically just an exertion for the moment. A kind of sense of um, just not giving up on yourself right now rather than so that later such and such. So on the one hand, it is one of those paradoxes because the uh, exertion grows as you have more insight into what begins to dissolve into suffering and what gives you inner strength. But that's not like a goal in the usual sense, because you never actually reach the place of full inner strength, or the roots of suffering gone forever. What they say, actually, in the Buddhist path, it's interesting, because there isn't just sort of like one enlightenment. There's like moments of deeper and deeper and deeper realization, stage after stage after stage of deeper and deeper realization. And then it's said, you know, even the notion of full enlightenment would be that then you begin to really live, rather than it's a sort of like an ending. So it's much more the notion of beginning to get the hang that every ending is a beginning, if you see what I mean. That you're always going forward, because it's limitless, that's the point. It's insatiable because it's limitless. Like in one sense, it could sound sort of depressing, you could never do enough. But it means more like you could never live long enough to experience the limitlessness that is available to the human being. The limitless insights, the limitless compassion. There's so much that's available. So it's sort of insatiable. And not to mention the fact that if you make a vow to save all sentient beings, you might as well have it insatiable exertion because you'll never reach the end of that. One of the uh, four vows in the Zen is, you know, sentient beings are numberless. I vow to save them. Desires are endless. I vow to command them. It's sort of like God. So again, the notion of exertion is with the threefold purity. And that's what gives it its limitless quality. If you have a sense of heavy duty, one who's exerting themselves and the action of exertion and the goal of exertion, and it's all tied up with trying to achieve. You know, exertion is a big one in this doggy dog world that was being described. <laughs> Misunderstanding of exertion. So, in thinking about these paramitas, I was thinking about how in the traditional teaching on the Four limitless ones. They talk about the near enemy and the far enemy. And I didn't say very much about that, but you might remember that the near enemy of compassion was like pity or sentimentality, and the far enemy was cruelty. 
And so I was thinking that even though I've never seen any teaching on this, there's definitely near enemies and as well as foreign enemies of parmitas. I want to think about that way. And I think the near enemy part is especially helpful because, for instance, um, the near enemy of patience can be just repression. Or it can also definitely be sort of grin and bear it, just endurance. And as you know, the far enemy is said to be aggression. I don't much like this word enemy, but I don't know quite how else to express it. You get kind of cute and say something like that. The near message and the far message. And so with exertion, definitely the near enemy is like um, pushing through. It's what usually comes to mind when people talk about exertion, or if it doesn't come to mind, it's what you do anyway. You don't have a concept about it. So this is very different, very different indeed. That's what makes it a paramita rather than the usual kind of striving or you know, just a pushing, pushing, pushing. And it's said that the far end of exertion is laziness, and there are three kinds. And the way Trumpa Mache talks about these three kinds is the first is laziness as a comfort orientation, which is you know, sitting around the pavilion. And the second is a loss of heart. And the third is a couldn't care less attitude. And uh, I don't have to say a lot about those, but I think it's helpful just to think of these things like laziness as just wanting to kind of deaden the pain and comfort some kind. Remember, remember she used to talk about going to the beach as lying in dirt. <laughs> this is a, a Tibetan's view of people lying on, sunning themselves on the beach. <laughs> lying in dirt. I think he never got it, you know, I just never he could get it. What we were doing there. And um, I heard, I once heard a story about the Dalai Lama watching people smoke, and he would just like watching and say, why? Why are they doing that? Like, what's going on there? <laughs> like, he didn't kind of get it which I guess is a good indication that he has no addiction. But, you know, comfort orientation, that kind of laziness, which is really wanting to just not feel the pain. And then the a loss of heart, I think that's a good one to think about. Laziness is just a loss of heart, you just give up. I think to me that's the most powerful one to think about in terms of exertion going wrong. Because this uh, striving kind of exertion, you just sets you up for a loss of heart. But this kind of uh, joyful exertion, or the joy to do what will help you, doesn't lead to loss of heart. So in some sense, when there is loss of heart, one feels so dragged down and unable to move, unable to do anything. It's a very, very deep kind of laziness, I think we don't even call it laziness because it's so paralyzing. And sometimes it's in a lighter also. But I think the main thing is that if we work in our lives with cultivating this joy to do what develops the inner strength and the flexible mind and trust in our basic nature, then that kind of loss of heart will be less prevalent and more workable when it arises. And finally, the couldn't care less kind of laziness is you know, just basically a kind of total unwillingness to change or do what will help. Sort of like you're impressed, so you get in bed, pull over the covers, turn the heat way up, and uh, basically stay there for days and days and days. And if anyone tries to cheer you up or get you out of there, you just get mad at them. Or, you know, another sort of combination of couldn't care less and comfort orientations, you know, just sit in front of the TV and uh, drink beer and eat chips until all the shows are off and you're just watching the patterns on them. <laughs> and you just sit there. And there's just some sense of you, you just don't want it. So. so I think the idea here is that you work more and more with gaining insight through the reading studying and through the contemplation and meditation beginning to get insight into what really helps you to develop this inner strength and this flexibility and trust 
what helps you to nurture a soft spot rather than cover it over. So with each of these, I think, you know, like um, with discipline, definitely the near enemy is some kind of regimentation, you know, like punishing your badness or rules and regulations that are like vegetation and very rigid. And so they all have these qualities and you could just kind of think about them. But I think it brings up an interesting and more profound subject to begin to think about what are their near enemies and far enemies, is it brings up an interesting subject, which is that when we uh, work with something like the paramitas, it's very easy to understand them in a lopsided way, which is to say understand them in a dualistic way, a good, bad way. And um, that doesn't help. It doesn't help to think of them as a, like an ideal you're supposed to live up to, and if you fail, then, then you're on the bad side. Because all that does is uh, bring you further and further away from any kind of connection with the soft spot or with clarity of mind. No insight comes from that kind of um, being paralyzed by right and wrong kind of thinking. So what I mean by this is the paramitas are more in the realm of, as I've said again and again, they're more in the realm of paradox or uh, not so easy to pin down. Because, for instance, just to take regression, if you look at the paramita of patience and then its opposite is, is aggression, if you say patience is good and aggression is bad, you're setting yourself up in some way. You're actually dividing yourself in half. You're setting it up for it to be in a struggle with your own energy. But on the other hand, if you say there's nothing wrong with aggression, you see, that's also dualistic thinking. And then you're just, you don't want to say aggression is bad or there's nothing wrong with aggression. And you're only comfortable if you're thinking that way. Or patience is good or patience is bad. But these paramitas take you beyond that kind of limited thinking altogether. But of course we start right where we are, with our limited way. And there's no need to be ashamed of that. That's just where we start. But we begin to relate to that in a very open way, looking at it with great clarity and with great um, compassion, just exactly where we are. And we apply these principles of patience and so forth, not to create further duality, but to actually begin to let us step more and more into a very open situation, which isn't pinned down, which is much more uncertain, but much more creative and dynamic and true, the true situation, our true nature, which isn't fixed into yes and no. So usually we criticize ourselves for our undisciplined nature, or we criticize ourselves for our stinginess, and so forth. But there's a beautiful chapter in Zen Mind, in his mind by Suzuki Roshi, where he actually talks on the subject. And um, to paraphrase it, he says something like, usually we criticize ourselves for our undisciplined nature. And we like ourselves when we're disciplined and we don't like ourselves when we're not disciplined. And he said, but you should realize that both this liking and this disliking are both Buddha activity. And in another teaching which was very similar by Sakyong, Nipam Rinpoche, he said, you should realize that whether you're liking or not liking, it's the bodhicitta trying to express it. So Suzuki Roshi, he says, um, well, we like flowers and we don't like weeds. It says, but nonetheless, Flowers wilt and weeds grow. <laughs> A 
unaffected by our opinions, unaffected by our attraction, aversion, and prejudice. So, a real understanding of these paramitas implies that getting to know the whole picture is what it's really about. And so this is very interesting. I really encourage you to take any one of them, such as giving, just practicing giving, or practicing patience, or any of them. But uh, generosity and patience are particularly kind of usable. And uh, for instance, if you start to practice generosity with sincere intention, sincere motivation to want to learn how to give and to give, you say, well, I'll just start out by giving whenever it occurs to me. And then uh, I'll particularly practice if I feel attached, trying to give that. And even if it's artificial in the beginning, I'll practice with the aspiration that I learned to truly give truly let go, to learn to not go back and get. So basically what will happen is that very soon, within probably the first five minutes, you'll become extremely intimate with your stinginess. And so it is with all these, if you actually wholeheartedly start to practice them, you get quite uh, familiar with uh, impatience, lack of discipline. Laziness and all the other. Much more intimate with them than 